Hello, and welcome to the Second Battle of Copenhagen. Now, this is one of the more interesting battles that, frankly, I think you can look at. It's got uh, the first battle of Copenhagen. Famously has Lord Nelson involved in it. The second battle of Copenhagen has Arthur Wellesley involved in it. A.K.A. Wellington. So frankly, this tells you the importance of Copenhagen, that it does get some very senior people in it. Now, normally at this point, I would be pointing out the both books I have used during this research, and I've used for putting this together. I can find Samuels is the struggle for sea power, which is the Royal Navy under the worst of the world, 1752 to 1782. So yes, it's slightly out of date here, but it's good for setting up some of the background, and that's what I've been using it for. And my main Bible had been Nicholas Rogers' Command of the Ocean, which I have put down somewhere this morning and now cannot find. Honestly, I cannot find it anywhere. I have looked the entire room over. And it has disappeared. No, I haven't tucked it behind boxes. There's always a, there's always a possibility I've done something really weird. But no. Um, cannot find it. Literally was using it less than an hour ago. We will, the show will go on. You have seen me point out the book quite often. Hopefully by the time of the live this afternoon, I will have found it. Anyway, so. It's not the... Th the thing is, the first battle takes place in 1801. This takes place in 1807. And what is interesting is this leads to a phrase developing in the English language. Copenhagen. To Copenhagenize something, or Copenhagen something. So um, that's why there's that title, Making Copenhagen a Verb. It's the second battle which does it. Right. And let's get into this. If I can get it to work. Thank goodness. So, some overview and context. Both battles start off the same thing. The Danish look like they're going to become under the control of the French system. Uh, in 1807, it's about the continental system, which is supposed to blockade Britain by keeping it out of Europe. The trouble is for Britain is that the access to the Baltic stores and various trade routes going through the North Sea, etc., are critical for British economy. That's the judgment. So that's not good. Now, the first battle of Copenhagen... The Royal Navy has various interests there. Nelson isn't sent to command it. Lord Parker, whose uniform I'm wearing in t-shirt form, is sent to command it because Nelson really isn't trusted thanks to the Lady Hamilton issues. But he does a good job. There's even a famous signal which Parker sends probably to give Nelson the a room to withdraw if he wishes to. And Nelson just says, I don't see the signal, using his blind eye, apparently, in a telescope. Anyway, they go in, they defeat, they manage to force their way into the harbour, they manage to take Danish ships. And here's the thing, six years later, they do exactly the same thing. This is going to sound strange, but six years later, you have the system emerging again. The Danish are again flirting with the continental system. There is a breakdown in Danish, Anglo-Danish communications. And the Danish are even less prepared than they were last time. This time, there are just 5,000 troops. And about the same number of militia to defend Copenhagen, their capital, where all their fleet is. Their fleet is not ready to go to sea, and their fleet, even if they did go to sea, is frankly not as much as what the fleet the British will send. But leaving that to one side, 
They let the same thing happen again. Here's the thing. We all know with the Dardanelles that the Dardanelles happens once. The Turkish learn from it. It makes the second time, uh, the coming, the returning of the Dardanelles, a fleet through the Dardanelles, very difficult. The third time, the Royal Navy sends their best admiral, they get straight through the Dardanelles. They manage to do it. World War One. there is an attack which is half-hearted and beaten off. The Turks learn from it. The Dardanelles isn't going to be forced again. They try and lay a siege, all sorts of things to get through. It doesn't happen. You can go back through countless times in history. More often than not, they learn, the nations who should do it are not attacked the same way again by the same people doing the exactly same tactics and win. You learn from it. And what's a really thing is, I have great affection for the Danes. They are some of the best military powers They, for their size. They do all sorts of innocent things to this day. But honestly, I do have to question their strategic judgment at the time. I can understand them allying with Napoleon, because frankly, if you don't ally, an ally with Napoleon and you share a land border with him, you're going to be invaded. So, yeah. I can understand doing that. It makes sense. It's safer. It's strategic. But if that's going to be your strategic route, if you're going to do that, then you must expect you're going to get attacked by the Royal Navy, if you have a Navy, and especially over vital routes, which you're probably going to do, especially if you're the Danish, because let's be honest, they're a seafaring nation. So defend your Navy, or at least have them out at sea. Where they have half a chance. They have no chance here. They, they're they just in the same place and they're caught and they're... <sighs> and this time it does become a verb. Basically, the first time it's a glorious victory. The second time it creates a new word in the English language. To Copenhagen, your enemy. That is, to take them by surprise and to take everything. The second time, the British do uh, shot with ground forces as well, which is an addition. They didn't do it the first time. But it's what they do. And again... Okay, so here's the first Battle of Copenhagen, and as we can see, honestly, under no circum, you're forcing your fleet into a narrow space with narrow channels. It should be easy to predict their field of fire. You have burning shots. You heat the cannonballs. You fire them. Yes, the range is a little difficult, but you can build bigger cannons and you can make sure you can get the range. It's on land. You have got a stone fortification. It's not a. There are not as many limits on you in terms of your size of your weapons as there are on a ship. First Battle of Copenhagen is really quite a cool battle. The British slowly move forward. They have mortar ships and various bombard units being used to bombard and push forward the attacks. Now, a mortar ship is a very interesting tool because mortars are not usually used by warships, so they are not usually used by naval gunners, so they actually bring royal artillerymen aboard to run those guns. Not to man them, to run them. So they will have a lieutenant or, or something of the Royal Artillery aboard. And they usually have a naval gunner as well. So these ships are often very, very accurate because they have a very, very, they have this sort of huge pool of mathematical gunnery resource aboard. 
and they only have to concentrate on one or two guns. So it's like you're taking the brain power, which is normally coordinating 20 to 30 guns, and then you're going, right, Matt, you can focus on these two. And yes, they're more difficult guns, but, you know, it works well. And those bombards, bombardments push back the defences. They push back very on, on various things, and they manage to allow the Navy to get in close and eventually for Nelson to do his manoeuvre of going in really, really closely and capturing a lot of Danish ships. Um, there is always the... Uh, my good colleague Drax's favourite phrase that the um, French Navy is the first foreign Royal Naval Reserve. Well, the Danish Navy, thanks to the sheer number of them that are captured in the minimal number of engagements, are either giving the French a run for their own money or have definitely secured the place of second foreign Naval Reserve. So the commander's chosen for the first battle, for the second battle. Um, you have Admiral James Gambler, Gambia, and General William Kaffer Eckhart. Now let's start off with these interesting gentlemen. Gambia is a founder of many, many things <laughs> when he dies. He's a great investor in education. There is a I'm going to remember the college now. When he dies, he is one of the founding people to send money out to the Kenyan College in Gambia, Ohio, which is named for him, as is the local Gambia Mountains. So Gambia, Ohio is named in part for James Gambia. Royal Navy Admiral. It's his, he has a long career. Let's just leave it at that. He has a long career. And he's a very experienced Admiral. He also, after this, actually gets involved in an issue which is called the Battle of the Basque Roads. And he ends up calling for a court-martial himself because he's accused of not attacking, of cowardice in the face of the enemy. And basically, he's accused by Cochrane and another admiral of being a coward because instead of chasing the French onto rocks where they were currently dashing themselves to try and secure prizes, he preferred to stand off and just let them sink themselves. Now, I'm sure it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that Cochrane and Gambia were connected to different political factions in the United Kingdom. Uh, the accusations, nor does the loss of the money, because as commander of the inshore squadron, Cochrane could have um, racked up quite a lot of money if uh, he'd been allowed to pursue in against the French. Although, of course, the Royal Navy could have lost several ships and a lot of lives for Gambia felt for not much gain. He was a good commander. And a good admiral. So then we have General William Cathcart. Now, Cathcart is one of those forgotten generals of the Napoleonic War. And actually, it's quite sad he's forgotten. Uh, Gambia is forgotten, but Cathcart in, you know, Gambia has a couple of decent battles and all sorts of things wandering around. Cathcart, well, he shouldn't be forgotten because whilst he does such great positions as commanding the forces in Scotland and having to, you know, command an expedition to Hanover and all sorts of really, really great things, what he really does, which is really quite important, is that, and he's not full general, he's only a lieutenant general, actually, at this point, um, but... He is the ambassador and military commissioner sent to Russia to help coordinate them. And if you consider during the 
war of liberation and various issues in that period, he was absolutely critical to maintaining the alliance and success of the formations against Napoleon. Without him, a lot of it wouldn't have been achieved. So, both these guys I've forgotten, and really they shouldn't be, because they did quite a lot of very successful stuff. But successful commanders, if they aren't one or two, are often forgotten in history. At their time, Admiral James Gambier and... I'm calling him General William Cathcart because he's sort of... At, there's a debate over whether he was an acting general during the operation or not. But seeing as his force includes... Let's see. Um, let's see. He has... A Major General von Linsing on his command, Major General Bloomfield, Ma Lieutenant General Sir George Ludlow, um, Lieutenant General Sir David Baird, Major General Sir Arthur Wellesley, and Major General Van Dreckel, and that's just the ones in charge of his major constituent units. I think probably acting general is more than that. He's a general at this point. We have record, not he's recorded as being promoted later. But I'd say if you've got uh, Lieutenant General Sir George Ludlow and Lieutenant General Sir David Baird under your command, those are fairly senior, quite um, preeminent people. I don't think they're going to be submitting to the command of another Lieutenant General. I think you have to be quite you have to be senior enough to give them orders. And he's also got Major General Sir Arthur Wellesley. At the point, Whew. lots and lots of funds, and he has, broadly speaking, well, he has the uh, King's German League division, Legion, the King's German Legion division um, of four brigades. He ha which are always a premier unit that's under von Dreckeld. Uh, then there's Wellesley's technically in charge of the reserve with one brigade, but he does most of the fighting, which we'll be talking about in a bit. Then there's the first division, which includes a guards brigade, and the second division, which concludes is made up of three brigades. The first division has another brigade as well, but and he also has a very significant force of artillery and engineers, bringing with him uh, 84 field guns and 101 siege guns. This was not a small force being deployed. And it's going to get more interesting when we start looking at the ships being sent. So here's the British fleet being sent, and this is what I want to talk about specifically in this part one of two of the introductions. Both are going to be roughly 20 odd minutes. So, the Prince of Wales, 98 guns. A second rate. Now, I've talked about previous battles, and... You know, you've, you're talking about a major force being sent. You've got a second, uh, only a one second-rate ship, though. All the rest are third rates. There are even some sixty-four third rates and some sixth rates. This is not a premier fleet. And interesting again, Gambia is quite a senior admiral. Um, I've been trying to find out whether he was Admiral of the White, Blue, or Red at this point. I have a feeling it wasn't the Red. I, I don't think it was the Red. But I'm still not quite sure, Blue or White, there is a dispute. 
Either way, he's a very, very senior admiral. If he wants a first rate to command, he could have it. And again, this is another time where you find a very senior admiral, like the first Bing in the battle we talked about, um, Palarizo. He's basically going, we don't need that. I don't need that. I, I, give me third rates. I will take a force of third rates. You need these ships for other operations. You need those ships for those fleets. You don't need that. No, no, no. I will take these. And he is taking good ships from him. He's got Captain. He's got Galar. He's got Hercule. He's got Maida. He's got Orion, Resolution, Spencer, Vanguard. These are not bad ships. They are good, solid third rates, but they are third rates. And his vice admiral does... Stanhope tries to make a sort of case of, um, well, you know, uh, I, I think I should be, uh, we should be in, no, you're getting a third rate as well. I'm going to be in commanding from a second rate. And second rates don't have the best reputation. They have the strength and height of a first rate. But they're not as long as a first or a third rate is, but they have, so they are just as heavy, but short and basically short and stubby. So they don't handle as well. They're not as fast and they don't handle as well in their design. It's well known that. An admiral going to sea, setting up his flagship, he can demand a first rate. A first rate will be made ready for him. Yes, it won't be easy. But the Royal Docks do have some first rates. The Royal Navy never has too many first rates, but they have enough going around. They do have one or two spare. They could get one up and running for him, but no, he wants a second rate. He also has fun in that he's offered, uh, because he's taking so much of a fleet to take rear admirals, and he goes, no, I will take Commodores, and he takes two of those. He does have two captains on his flagship with him. And he seems to have one operating as ship captain and one acting as flag captain. Which is a little unusual at the time, but when you consider the amount of work and organisation he's going to need to do in administration... Having a captain with him as spare is probably seems sensible. And certainly seems to fit with the way he organizes the rest of his fleet. And if you go down the names, there is a Captain John Bly there, there is a Captain Thomas Graves there, Isaac Woolley, Peter Punje, John Colville, Samuel Hood Lindsay, Sir Archibald Collingwood Dixon. Captain George Burlton, Roberts, uh, Captain Robert Stockfield, Captain Alexander Fraser, Captain Donald Campbell, Captain Robert Campbell, Captain John Draper, Captain George Collier, Captain Clotworthy Upton, Captain Charles Dashwood, Captain Conway Shipley. These are not... Eventually, he does get a rear admiral sent out to him as well. This is the interesting thing. Um, he arrives first with this force, but... Eventually, the Admiralty does actually decide, we're sending you more ships because we're going to send you another Rear Admiral. We're going to send you actually a Rear Admiral. And again, Minotaur in another 74. And it's superb, valiant, inflexible, laden. Again, Defence, Mars, Agamemnon, and African. All these ships showing up, these are neither commanded by junior captains or weak captains, nor are they small, weak ships, but they are not, by any stretch of the imagination, the first flight of a fleet. This is the major operation going on. If you think about this period, this is the major, major operation which the Royal Navy is mounting, and is a critical operation. But the commander has, again, like... First John, uh, first Bing has gone. I don't need that. What I need are third rates, which are handy ships, which allow me to get in the shallows and do the, do the operations. Well, as far into the shallows as any raid ship can. 
and I will take a 74 gun Royal Navy ship up against anything. And I will take a second rate. And he actually says this. The reason he's taking a second rate is because he wants the height of the masts. Not because he wants the firepower. That's useful, but that's not much an advantage. Um, in his world view, if you consider it, they have 24 more guns than a 74, which is, what, 12 more on a broadside? The bigger 74s mostly carry the same weight of shot in terms of the largest cannon they do. It's for its height. Allows him to see what's going on. Kafkar turns up on the 12th of August, and the whole fleet is basically hanging around in August. It doesn't really hit, take action till September, but which is why we're doing it today. But it's it's there, and the Danish see it. And again. Starts off with it's posturing there, and it's a large military force, and all these things are posturing there. And it's an attempt almost at naval diplomacy. The idea is that this will make the Danish talk to us, this will make the Danish think, because we've done this to them once before. So they won't want it to happen again. And it happens again. Right, so Twitter. Where else can you find me? Twitter, Patreon, Global Maritime Mystery, part two of these videos. <laughs> hope you enjoyed that, and hope you'll enjoy part two. This has been 28 minutes. Well, 27 on the bit at the moment, but thank you for that. Uh, thank you for listening, and hope you enjoyed it. And the second one probably about the same length. Thank you. Oh, and remember, on Patreon, you can uh, you can do two thing, three things. You can find all the slides. You can make suggestions for next month's Patreon videos, and you can vote on which ones will be next month's Patreon videos. That all sounds pretty cool. Thank you. Take care and have a nice day. And see you for part two and for the live later.